Mike, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. You come highly recommended. I was just pre-recording the the bio that you sent me, and uh, I think we'll be able to get that in there so that it works really well. Thank you for joining me, buddy. I really am looking forward to hearing your story, especially about trophy hunting and, and in the conservation behind trophy hunting. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Absolutely. So why don't you get started just by giving us, you giving us a brief definition or uh, tell us who you are, basically. Yeah, so I, uh, I have a day job. I'm a professor at the University of Georgia. I'm actually the head of the Department of Genetics right now. I okay. lost my mind and agreed to do that for a year. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I've got great colleagues and I, I work on the genetics of natural populations. I love being in the field. That's why I love being a hunter. Uh, and so I work on plants, animals, all sorts of things. And conservation biology has been an emphasis for many years for me. Um, and in particular, recently, uh, over the last uh, three or four years, I've really been writing a lot about my hunting uh, trips, my outdoor trips, as well as emphasizing being able to put together my research science and my love of hunting and love of being in the field with the passion of communicating to folks how important hunters are all over the world right. uh, for conservation biology. And that's why I wrote this new book. Uh, it's based around a model in Africa, but we have a wonderful model here too with the right. Robertson Act being put in the 1930s and hunters and, and yeah, uh, that's actually the, being threatened right now. I don't know if you saw that, but there's the Senator who has who's proposed <sighs> to do away with the Pittman Robertson Act for the yeah. listeners who don't know what that is, is this a excise tax that hunters and anglers placed on themselves back in 1933, I believe it was. And it's an 11% excise tax that we pay mm -hmm for anything related to, to hunting and fishing in the United States. And all that money is sent back to the States to be used for conservation, to preserve the sports that we love so much. Yep, exactly. Last year was in uh, 22, well, 21, sorry. They had $1.5 billion go back to the States. That was a new record. Wow, um, that's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And it, and like you said, it goes straight back to the states and it's mandated that it can only be used for conservation work in the states. Right. So right. this this attack on that is going to wreck state budgets. It's going yes. to destroy ecosystems. It's going to do a lot of really bad things for conservation. And, it is. Uh, it is. I think the people and I'm on sidebar here. I think the 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 uh lot the logic behind this the person proposing it is they're they're trying to um hurt hunters and yep. and anglers by by taking wave that but what they're doing is they're hurting wildlife and they're hurting ecosystems as you said and access to all that as even the people who don't participate in hunting but who like to hike and backpack and camp they benefit from getting to see the game animals Absolutely. And without that money, you know, everything is driven by money, Mike. It, with, without that money, then you're going to see some devastating things happen to, to wildlife across the country. And I think I think what people don't understand, and that's one of the things I like to communicate in articles and books, is that it's not just, you know, white-tailed deer or mule right. deer or quail or pheasant or whatever we're hunting. It's actually songbirds and trees and plants and microbes in the soil everything right. is right. being conserved because that, of that money absolutely absolutely but all right so i want to transition now to the i want to let's see how, how i'm trying to figure out how to ask what i want to ask mike before i get to it is the phrase trophy hunting elicits mm -hmm. certain types of emotions in people from for hunters i think i know what it elicits it elicits you know the the best specimen of that or the yeah the the oldest best representative of that specimen or species rather yes. um for the non-hunter it gives a completely different 
I think, uh, vision or, or opinion about what trophy hunting is. So let's break that down a little bit before we get into the, into the science behind it, if you will. Sure. Well, and one of the things that's been very encouraging for me, if I can take a step back and, and say that here's my, here's my viewpoint on our demographic in the United States and around the world. I think it's, you know, this is me being a biologist, but also a scientist. I think of it as a bell-shaped curve. So I think of it as this thing that we would use to break down any kind of data and we would divide it up left to right, let's say. And I'm, and I'm not trying to be political here, but on the left-hand side of that curve, where it dips down and almost goes to zero, I think we have some folks we're never going to convince that hunting is okay. They're anti-hunting. Absolutely. On the right hand side are people like you and I who are passionate about it. We love it. We know what we're doing. We know why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. In the middle is the largest section. And that those are our non-hunting friends and family mm -hmm. members. My wife is a non-hunter. Now she's my videographer and my photographer on my safaris and my hunting trips. So she's not an anti-hunter. She just doesn't. And she loves shooting. OK, mm -hmm. loves shooting. And and she participates in the shooting sports, but she just doesn't have a desire to hunt. Right. But she understands the models and why we have conservation happening now. Trophy hunting. My non-hunting friends, and, and once again, this is why I write a lot of articles and books about this, because I want to communicate to them our passion, but also the utilization of animals that we take. Mm -hmm. My number one, and I, t I told a friend of mine this the other day, and they just, they just grinned at me. I took my first white-tailed deer at the age of five in the hill country of Texas, shooting a little 243 off of my poor father's shoulder. I'm sure that's why he was deaf in that ear. Yeah, I'm sure. Daddy, daddy, daddy couldn't hear out of that ear. And I think that was because his son crawled that stock and shot that rifle so many times off of his shoulder. I took that deer at the age of five and it was a doe. It still stands as my number one trophy of my entire life. That was 60 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Okay. And so I try to communicate to folks, trophies are not necessarily what you might expect. They're memories, they're memory yeah. makers. They're, they're the things that bring us joy when we think about being out in the field. Yeah. But the other part of this is that no trophy, we're not poachers. Okay. We're not just taking ivory. When we, take an animal it's completely utilized right meat, skin etc yes it is and that's that's a very important part of the process is for <clears throat> people to understand like my family we when, when my children were young they're all they're all adults now but growing up we had five kids at home so mm -hmm. it took and we preferred to eat wild game and wow. here living here in south carolina we have very liberal bag limits on our white-tailed deer and we also have feral hogs which there's no limit on those and i love to hunt pigs <laughs> and and so it we we learned it would take about seven deer and three pigs to feed us for a year mm -hmm. and, and that's well within the bag limits you know i was not yep. going outside of that uh and and it was important to me to make sure that i got adult those for good meat or you know, mature bucks, but, uh, I would really work on the does cause we had such an overpopulation of does at the time. Right. Um, I would work on the adult does in order to put meat in the freezer and we process our own meat. We, we, you know, we trim it. We, we, my wife and I have a system, you know, I, mm -hmm. I do the trimming, she grinds it and she vacuum seals it or, or whatever. And it, and it's, it, it has worked great for us. And the same thing with the feral hogs it, is that, you know, we, it's just wild pork and, uh, and we, and we That's love right. it, you know? And so there's not any of the animal that goes to waste whatsoever, whatsoever. And, you know, when you go to a place like Africa, it becomes, or, or anywhere else in a developing country and you take a game animal, 
you realize and at what you realize immediately is that our conception of total utilization is stops a little short. Now we're using all the meat, right? But, and, and many of us use some of the internal organs like heart, liver, yes. Yes. those sorts of things. I like those. I do too. But over there, say in Africa, when I took a sable antelope or when I took a Cape Buffalo that was uh, for what was called a community Buffalo. In other words, it went to feed a village. I didn't, I was not allowed to bring horns or any, any other kind of uh, tr quote unquote trophy back. Everything went to the village, but boy, I tell you, everything goes mm. the stomach, the intestines, everything are clean. Everything is cleaned out. Everything is utilized. And wow. it is amazing watching, you know, I kidded with my, my guy, my pH and my trackers. I said, you know, I've eaten stomach all over the world. I mean, I've traveled all over the world and I said, I don't like it, but obviously I'm in the minority here. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. <yeah. laughs> they loved it. They love tripes or what I would call tripes. So the, right, the right. stomach and, but everything's taken <laughs> every scrap. And I think that we don't appreciate that in a, in a place like here in a developed country, I don't think we appreciate why poaching is such a strong force in developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the same way with our country, right? I mean, when right. we landed on the East coast, we ate everything yeah. all the way to the West coast. That's why we're reintroducing elk right now over here. Yeah. That's Yep. And you would be well aware of this being in the East. And it's why we were, I mean, white-tailed deer in Georgia were extinct. I know you would know this. They were extinct until the 1920s. Yeah. And yeah. the reason is, is because we had bush meat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, we could call it that, you know. Yeah. When, when people were hungry, they went out and they took what they could get and, and, yeah. and feed their family with. Right. Exactly. And, and then you had the civil war where yep. you have to feed an entire army and there were 40 or 50 men who were allocated to feeding the army. They're out killing everything. Yep. Cause you got 30,000 men you got to feed. Right. Yep. So that takes a lot of deer, a lot of elk, a lot of squirrels, a lot of rabbits. They just, they're just out killing everything they can. Cause they got to feed this entire army. Yep. Every day. Exactly. Yeah, you got to feed them every day. And that's a part of the history that I would like to learn more about, about where, where it comes to, to, to animals. I know I've read the Lewis and Clark uh, stories mm -hmm. of how they had to feed their, their, and, and that was a small group it was, I can't remember now, like 36, 37 mm -hmm. men, something very small group, but still that's a lot of stomachs. You start mm -hmm. feeding an army in the United States as they're traveling around and that's decimating the wildlife. Mm -hmm. you know, for, um, I'm way off point here. Way off <laughs> no, I think, I think what we have to understand is this is why we needed conservation right, and right. restoration in this place and in other places all around the world. This yeah. is why you need those hundred dollars to keep pumping into those, into our States so right. that we can keep from having the loss that we had before. And, you know, uh, on that point, it's not just the dollars, but hunters are the ones who went to their states and said, we need to impose bag limits. Yep. We need to self-impose a, a, a maximum amount of animals that we can take per species. I remember I like to read some of the old writers of the like Nash Buckingham and Archibald Rutledge and stuff. Yep. And I remember if you've ever read Nash Buckingham, there's a story he calls my greatest day. I, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, and they had at the beaver dam duck club they had a self-imposed limit of 25 ducks okay and i think it was 15 geese self-imposed mm -hmm. but th but this was before that mm -hmm. okay and on one day he and his and his uh companion if i'm getting the numbers i'm really close if i'm not exactly right they killed 50 ducks mm -hmm. i think it was 30 geese uh 20 something close to 30 snipe another wow. 40 or 50 quail and two wild turkeys oh my goodness in the same day <laughs> you know i know that's a guess a lot of ammo right a lot. There. Yeah. i didn't even know to take that much ammo with you but <laughs> but so what nash says in a future story of his is that we realized that we are hurting ourselves 
mm-hmm. by by doing this. And so they started petitioning the state representatives of the states. The the Beaver Dam Hunt Club was on the border of Tennessee and um, uh, Arkansas. Mm. right there uh, on the border there. And they started petitioning the people in there saying, we need to have a statewide limit on not just these, you know, cause they were all bird hunters mostly, mm-hmm. but also on, on other animals. And it started yep. the process. And this was in the early 1900s. It started the process for States to start developing a department, of natural resources or mm-hmm. game and fish organization, depending on the state, what they call it. We did that to ourselves, and that's important to note, is that the hunters called for that to happen. Absolutely. I I think the self-regulation, you know, you can see it, say, permit system over in Africa, for example, the same sort of thing. There's not a raping, you know, and a pillaging of these populations. They have to regulate the hunting. And All the right. officers know that. Why don't and you we, explain that to us? Because I've never been to Africa and a lot of our listeners never have. So why don't you, at least I haven't been to Africa yet. Yes. Emphasis on the yet. There okay. you go. You've yeah. got to get over there. I've been, I've been dreaming. <laughs> I've been dreaming about it, Mike, for 30 years, but I uh, just, I yep. just haven't made it. So I have explain. some recommendations. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that. Well, so, uh, the, so the permit system. So let's, let's take Katata 11, uh, where I, uh, based this new book around. So Katata 11 is a hunting concession in Mozambique. It's run by Zambezi Delta Safaris. So in 19, let's, let's do the history. So in 1994, they began hunting there again. Now it had been a Mecca in the 1960s, but then they had wars and those wars decimated everything. This is Mozambique, right? Animals, everything, right? Go ahead. This is Mozambique. This is in Mozambique. Okay. I want to get the country's name out there. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. In Mozambique. Yep. So they had a civil war in Mozambique from 75 to 92. And it, this area was game rich. The rebel army in particular, we were talking about armies knew that this was a game rich area. The governmental army and soldiers were in the urban areas. And so they basically had a, they, they had a stalemate, mm-hmm. but the rebel army moved into this area, set up a meat processing plant. You went from things like 45, 50,000 Cape buffaloes to 1200 in 1994. Wow. You went from uh, thousands and thousands of sable antelopes to 30 in 1994. You went 30. From, 30 individuals. You went from water bucks you had in 1974, 73. Now these are all game counts that were done by biologists before and after the civil war. So that's how we know these numbers. But before the civil war, the water bucks were in the shoot. I don't even know 60,000 and they went down to a few hundred in 94. Now, in 94, Mark Haldane and his partners come in. He's the outfitter. He, he, they come in and they go, okay, this is how many game animals we have. We've got to leave water bucks alone. We've got to leave sable antelopes alone. There were only eight zebra left. Eight? And there were eight. And there had been thousands. Very few eland. Just everything was gone that had been a protein source. So they went to the government and they said no permits no hunting permits are going to be requested for these lists of these species, even though sable antelopes are high ticket items there. I mean, they could have made a lot of money, but they knew we just don't have enough. Now, by doing that and slowly over the years, they would add, say, a sable one sable bull, Mm -hmm. you know, permit in five years later. They let those populations build up. Now they do I believe it's 20 something sable antelopes. They now from 30, they have 3000. Mm. The water bucks are now back up to 25,000. The mm. Cape buffaloes are now from 1200 back up to something probably in the mid 40,000s. They oh, may wow. even be more than that. So the permit system, as time went on, and as those populations were restored through anti-poaching, feeding the local folks, 
all of the game meat goes to the local folks or it feeds the hunters, the, the number of hunters who come through. By doing that, poaching was suppressed. Uh, they have anti-poaching squads that are made up of the local folks as well. But it was as they built up, they could then add permits. Mm -hmm. And now the animals as an ecologist, conservation biologist person, what we call that is they're, they've exceeded carrying capacity. Right. which means that in Katata 11, which is half a million acres or more, the Marameo complex is a couple of million acres or two and a half million acres. They've spread out outside mm -hmm. of Katata 11 and because there's no fence. So that, so that's the permit system to give you a counter to that. Mark had been given four leopard permits uh, each year when he walked in. And after two years, two hunting seasons, he and his workers decided that that was too many. And they went to the government and they said, we only want two, two male leopard per year to be hunted. And that's what they've kept. Now, that was an amazingly courageous decision. They didn't have diddly squat when they were there in terms of money, when they came in in 94, they needed every penny they could bring in from hunters that gave up at least $40,000 or more. That's what I was going to say is they just cut their own purse strings, but they did it for the future of the animals. They did. And they have a wonderful scientific program. I went out collaring leopards one night and it, it's amazing. They're studying these cats, mm -hmm. but they want to be real careful with their animals and their, mm -hmm. their habitats. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I hear a lot about, about African hunters is, is, um, some of the tags are expensive, as you just mentioned, leopard, maybe $20,000, Cape Buffalo. I've seen prices from 12000 to 18000 for Cape Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And we know that it costs a lot of money to run these outfits. So the, so the outfitter or the professional hunter is obviously getting a good bit of that money, but he's also hires a lot of people in the yep. area. Um, so this money is not just making professional hunters wealthy it's also benefiting the entire region. Can you speak to that at all? Absolutely. I'll use Katata 11 again as the model. So when they went in, uh, the Santa villagers there were like everywhere else in Mozambique um, were malnourished. Mm -hmm. uh, Mozambique has one of the highest juvenile malnourishment rates in the world. It's almost 50% of little ones. Uh, you'll see them with the swollen bellies. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that in photographs. That's what's called quashicor, and it's a protein deficiency uh, is what that is. Little ones are just not getting enough protein. They may be getting carbohydrates from rice or something else, but they just don't get any protein. And so their bodies are stunted. Uh, cognitive ability is depressed. Their life expectancy just plummets. Okay. Right, I mean, in right, terms of right. and disease resistance is not there now. So when Mark and his colleagues went in, that's what Katata 11 was like. And the whole of Marameo complex was like all of that. There's a bunch of hunting concessions in there. So when all of the hunting concessionaires bought their leases in night and started in 94, that's what it was like. Mm -hmm. Folks were malnourished. And so the, what they did was not, they had they had parallel paths. Okay, they knew they had to improve the lives of the local Santa villagers, so that then there would be conservation of all these different habitats. In other words, they wouldn't have to destroy the habitats to just try to survive. Right. Well, as of today, what you have in Katata Eleven because of employment, because of feeding giving protein. They, every family gets 10 pounds of red meat a, a week. Okay. All year long. And then because of all the community programs that they have going on from taking some of the game animals for them. Okay. So they have that, but they also have a fishing program, which brings in a lot of meat protein. So they fed them and then they employed them. Mm -hmm. And so they have hundreds of people they employ every year in Katata 11. What that also means is that these guys and gals don't need the money coming in from the bushmeat poaching again to have income. 
So within Katata 11, and I describe this in the book because it's just amazing. Within, a, within Katata 11 in particular, they have created a middle class mm. of villagers outside of Katata 11 in the rural, rural areas. What you have are still hunter gatherers. Now I have sort of a romantic view of hunter gatherers, right, right. but what that means is those folks are starving to death Yeah, yeah. because they're malnourished. And, and also within Katata 11, they built clinics, they built schools, they built at, they put in agricultural fields. They got grants for tractors and a huge disc plow, uh, plow for from the Michigan Safari Club International bottom this. And they for it's all free of charge for the Santa villagers. They plow the fields, they give them fertilizer free of charge, break it up. They do rice, they do maize, corn, uh, they do sesame. They do a lot of different things. They've set up a honey production. So uh, a lot of this money is coming from the hunters who are buying these permits. Is that correct? That is correct. It is only coming. It is only funded through hunters. Now, okay. part of that is through people like Cabela family foundation, right? Uh, Safari club international, Dallas Safari club, et cetera, et cetera. But not there, there is no, <laughs> I said this on another podcast and somewhat all, I think they almost came through the screen. It's not Bill Gates. <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> yeah thank goodness because it's enlightened i'm sorry i don't mean to be mean towards bill gates but it is enlightened in the sense that they understand there needs to be conservation through trophy hunting right and right. the locals want that yeah. because they're fed and because they're employed etc right um so in this katata 11 if i'm pronouncing that correctly yep these hunters will come in and they will buy these permits for a variety of animals, much more than the ones that you listed. Cause, cause you listed Cape Buffalo and Sable and sure. zebra and Eland, but there's a lot of different varieties of animals. It, Cause again, give me the acreage again. How much was it? Uh, Katata 11 is a half a million acres. They also do some partnerships with their, the concessionaires that are up against them that border them and yeah. the other Katatas. So it, the acreage is, in the millions, but yeah, very large, very large. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a, a, a lot of different species and that yes. just brings in a lot of money because each, each permit just for the listener who may not understand this is that if you go to Africa, then you hire the professional hunter at, for a daily rate. And then you pay a fee for each specific animal, like a zebra, maybe I'm just going to throw out a number. I don't know here. A zebra may be $1,500, a Cape mm -hmm. Buffalo, maybe 12,000 and Impala, maybe, uh, a thousand dollars. Again, I just, just use yeah. some dumb numbers to explain it. And so you, you pay per animal That's and, right. and that money, I mean, it, it adds up pretty quick, right? Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. It does. And the, and the other part that I tell my non-hunting friends, and I refer to this in the, uh, once again, in articles in the book is that this is called hunting not shooting. Right. So we pay, like you just mentioned, we buy a permit and that is not refundable. And so if I don't get the animal and that's happened, I, all of us have gone yeah. out hunting without getting the animal. Yeah. And so I a pay lot of, a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well, I, you know, I didn't want to accuse you of that. I know well, that. For I'll, me. I'll, take that. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. Well, and, and so we go and we pay for that permit and 20%, I think it's 23, 24% of that permit goes directly to the local Santa villagers in Katata 11. So if I don't get the Impala, or the Cape Buffalo or whatever, I don't get that permit money back. Now I don't pay, there's another fee. Once you get it, you pay the trophy fee. And that's also a big chunk of money, but you are exactly right. You know, you have daily fees, you have community fees, you have then the, you know, bed and breakfast kind of stuff fees. Yeah. And then you're paying your pH, your professional mm -hmm. hunter. And he, and then you are paying through all of this, all of the, all of the local folks who they have hired as right. mechanics or chefs or whatever else they're doing. Right. But yeah, those fees are non-refundable. The only one you don't pay if you don't get it is a trophy fee. Right. And uh, 
you know, so just to point that out, all of that money goes straight in there. And it's also nice because like I say, a percentage of it is just taken right off the top. It's like a tithe taken right off the top and dropped into the local villagers, right. uh, community projects and things like that. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we've kind of explained that really well. So now I want to give you a chance to, to really dive into your book and to tell us about how all that came together. Well, uh, bringing back the lions is the, the major title. It's got a minor title that everybody keeps telling me is a mouthful, but that's okay. Yeah. The, uh, but I, I, the reason the genesis for this book really came about when I was doing some interviews of conservation folks, conservation through hunting, uh, participants back in 2018. I, that's where the germ of this idea came from. So I was interviewing people like Mark Haldane, who I've mentioned, who's the outfitter in Katata 11. I was interviewing Dan Cabela, who heads up Cabela Family Foundation. And I was interviewing Ivan Carter, who's a conservation biologist over who's from Africa. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing all these guys and I realized that their overlap was this place in Mozambique called Katata 11. Uh, now they all have different backgrounds. Uh, they all come from different kinds of, um, yeah, even different kinds of spiritual backgrounds or whatever we want to call it. But what they, what they had in common was the understanding of why conservation through hunting worked mm -hmm. all over the world. So what I did was I approached Mark Haldane and I said, Mark, what would you think if I wrote a book about what you guys have done in Katata 11, starting in 1994 and bringing it to the present day? And he was intrigued by that. And so what happened was my wife, Frances, and I spent months <laughs> over in Mozambique last year. Uh, we were supposed to go in 20 and uh, 21 uh, was when we ended up having to go because 20, they shut Mozambique down and we couldn't, we couldn't get in right uh, because right. of COVID. And so we went over and what we did is this book is not your typical hunting book. Now there are hunts in there. Uh, hunts for little red diker, pygmy antelopes. There are, you know, there are hunts for Cape buffaloes. There, there are hunts in there. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to do was to talk about ecosystem restoration and regeneration reflected in the game animals, but then also talk, interview many, 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 many folks who are the locals, the St. Right. Abilities. Right. And so that's what I did. Uh, and there's a, there's a chapter on birds. It's called, you can have birds or charcoal, but not both. <laughs> and it's just talking about the fact that Mark Haldane brings in non-hunting birders at the, after the season is over because it is a Mecca. I mean, an absolute paradise for bird watchers. They're going to see species they'll never see anywhere else. Wow. The reason is, is because they have conserved that's this area and mm -hmm. the birds are there. So it's, it's that sort of thing, you know, interviewing those interviewing wildlife veterinarians. One of my chapters is on Zhao Almeida and he is a uh, Portuguese born, but he's, he and his family live in Mozambique. He's the top wildlife veterinarian in the country and in, probably in Africa to be honest. Right, right. Young guy. He's a non-hunter. Okay. He doesn't hunt, but he is incredibly passionate about keeping hunting concessions around because he understands that, for example, I asked him because he has a 10 year MOU memorandum of understanding with the Mozambique government. He does everything for them with regard to the, all of these areas that they've set aside. Mozambique's very progressive in setting aside wild areas like mm -hmm. the state of New York. They've set aside that amount of land is 20 some odd percent of their land mass, which is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I asked him, I said, you know, Zhao, you don't you don't hunt. And would you if they gave you the the right to do this and the power because he actually could have it. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. would you turn every one of these hunting concessions into a photographic concession? And his immediate response was visceral and very, very, it was really, really stark. He said it would be a catastrophe. Mm. And I said, why? He said, because if you fly over a photographic safari area that actually is economically viable, they're bringing in thousands of people a year. It's cut up with roads. It's draining the water out of the water system to try to get the animals to come to water holes to be photographed. He said, you have hotels all over the place. He said, it's a devastated landscape. He said, you fly over Katata 11, of course, which I did a bunch of times. He said, there are very few roads. They bring in maybe a hundred people a year because the income is so much better mm -hmm. and they can't cut the place up and ruin the habitats or they lose their animals. Mm -hmm. So he said, it would be a catastrophe. He said, if I could do it, I would reverse it. And he said, and I love taking photographs and I don't hunt. I said, mm -hmm. okay. But that's what the book's about. It's about the restoration of ecosystems. So bringing back the lions is a, titled that because they brought in lions that had been driven to extinction by us. Mm -hmm. They had been there, but they brought them back. And now that population is just increasing like crazy. And then they've also brought back cheetahs, but bringing back the lions describes not only the restoration of habitats, but the rejuvenation of human lives and turning human lives around to where everybody in Katata 11 has a roof over their head. Everybody mm -hmm. has food enough to eat every day. Mm -hmm. Everybody has medical treatment. Everybody has a school they can send their kids to. It's that sort of thing that I wanted to reflect in this book. Okay. Well, it's, it, it sounds really fascinating, Mike. It really does. And, it, and it's a point of view that needs to be told that it's, it, that it's, uh, it's not just about the animals and saving the animals. It's also about bringing a, an enormous amount of, of financial resources to a, a part of the world where you couldn't bring it any other way. Perhaps. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, but I'm curious cause you just mentioned in your, uh, there towards the end that they bring in about a hundred, 120 people a year into this concession. Also the term concession, that's like a boundary, right? Yeah, the concession is, uh, it's, you know, you, and in Mozambique, they're called katadas, but the concession is the mapped out portion of country that the government has set up of Mozambique and said, these boundary, this boundary is, uh, encapsulates Katata 11 or okay. Katata 13 or Katata. So it'd be like a game zone then out West. It'd be like a game zone out West, it, you know, absolutely. inside these boundaries, you're allowed to do this as far as hunting goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. All right. So a concession is similar to a, to a game zone. It's um, absolutely a, you know, we have wildlife management, areas right. here wma is right. here right yeah and that's what we have here in south carolina i was talking to a friend of mine i'm i'm hoping to get drawn from my mule deer tag in wyoming for 2023 and i was looking at the different game zones I'm like good gracious how do they come <laughs> up with drawing these things it's like 160 something game zones in wyoming just for mule deer and then antelope they're different zones and different numbers it, and, it really looks like gerrymandering to me really sometimes. Does. <laughs> it does. And their seasons overlap. So you could be hunting the same spot, but two yeah. different game zones, uh, yeah. depending on the animal that you're after. <laughs> it's really confusing. Uh, I really wish they could find a way to simplify that. But that's a good way to keep ignorant people out of uh, coming and applying for their license because they don't know where to go. <laughs> I may be one of them. I'm, I'm, I, I have to ask that. advice when I go west. I, I usually ask my brother. He he keeps up on this stuff better okay. than I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you mentioned season. I was always under the impression that uh, hunting in Africa is year round. Is it not? It can be, uh, but there are generally seasons uh, in Mozambique. In this portion of Mozambique. Um, it's tropical. So ah. what you don't do is hunt the rainy season yeah. for obvious reasons, because yeah. it's, just, it's just too wet. Yeah. Um, and so when we went, for example, in May of last year, that should have been passed just past the rainy season, but it was still raining yeah. and it was fun. 
uh, Francis, Francis looks at me and says, you know, one day when we're out in the middle of nowhere and we're soaking wet, she said, I thought it was supposed to be warm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I said, yes, ma'am, it is relatively, it is warm, <laughs> but yeah, when you're this soaking wet, it's it warm. It is cold. Here. Yes, it's cold. Yeah. But uh, by the time we went back in July uh, for the second trip and then later for the, for a third, you know, the, it's dried out and the grass, the other portion of this is that y- you have really tall grass when it's been raining. Okay, right after the wet season for obvious reasons. And then it starts, they start a burning process and they light it and, you know, they carefully burn and get the grass down. So you can actually see the animals a lot better Mm -hmm. in the later seasons. Now, some areas are dry enough where they could hunt them year round. Okay, they could. But most places also need an off season to improve roads, improve whatever else. Right, 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 right. And a lot of these animals that we're talking about, they only um, have babies one time a year and it's one or two, correct? Yeah, I think correct. Of, I think of the Impala species, it's one or two would be, would, would be normal. And then like the buffaloes and the bigger animals is one typically. Yeah. So the recovery time period is, it stretched out over a long period of time. It It is. And once again, in a place that is well run and the, these concessions are doing a concessionaires like Mark Haldane are doing a really wonderful job. You know, they're, they're ending up with so many animals because they can't take enough of them off really to put a dent in them. Uh, in the sense of the older bulls, you know, yeah. or the yeah. older rams or the older whatever. So, um, the, because, you know, it, one bull can, can breed dozens of females. Absolutely. Dozens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, you just see it, you know, one of the interesting things, and I have a couple of, couple of articles coming out on this in various magazines. Uh, I don't have anything in the book, about it per se, but the COVID year, that break in 2020, and I bet, I bet you may have seen it too in North America. Cause I did mm-hmm. is that that break in areas that were shut down, uh, particularly like in Africa or say Canada or New Zealand, Australia, mm-hmm. what you ended up with was incredible numbers of old, older animals. We saw, for example, warthogs, they could hardly walk because of that year. And I never realized that the harvest, say, of warthogs, Mm -hmm. the harvesting was so critical to get rid of those, you know, even if it's for meat, but to get rid of those older, older, older animals. Biologically, I should have realized it as a biologist, but after seeing coming in the next year after that, that gap, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, Now the bulls and everything else were huge, you know, (laughs) compared to what they were. So that I call it a sabbatic year in in an article I have coming out. So it's like that, you know, that that it was given that break, but it's necessary. The harvest of these animals every season, every or every year is really necessary for the health of the population. It is because they basically eat themselves out of house and home. I mean, it, as an, and I'll just use a round number. If you're normally taking a hundred animals off the landscape in a season and you don't this year, you have just added a significant um, resource that's going to continue to consume food. That the, that the new babies and the, and the new ones can't because exactly. the old ones are much bigger and, and more mature. So they're going to eat a lot more, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like, a uh, an Impala, it's about the same size as a white tailed deer is going to yep. eat about, uh, was six pounds a day, roughly, uh, mm-hmm. depending on the time of year and, you know, whether they're, right. you know, but it's about six pounds a day and drink three quarts of water a day. So, uh, you, you add that many animals into the system because you didn't take them by hunting measures you have really made a a significant impact on the landscape 
You really have. And and also you mentioned the young ones. I mean, the competition yeah. for those younger animals who are going to be less efficient mm -hmm. at knowing how to feed and feeding and also are going to be less aggressive. And so they're going to get out competed mm -hmm. by animals that you need replaced. Right. So, right. I mean, it, there's a cascade effect, but anyway, yeah. So it's, it, it was amazing. It was really amazing. And you saw it all over the landscape in Katata 11, what had happened because of that, because yeah. of the COVID shutdown. Yeah. We didn't have it so badly here because more hunters went out. Yeah. We were allowed to go out, right? Yeah. And yeah. We actually had the opposite effect in a did. lot of areas. I know here in South Carolina, we did. I actually got the, the, uh, uh, the 2021 harvest report like two, three days ago, and it was down like 13% from 2020. Mm -hmm. And the reason is the number of hunters that were in the field yeah. was 16% greater in 2020 than it was in 2021. And a lot of that we believe because people were not allowed to go to work and they were at home. And so they spent more time in the field. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much we could go with this. We could just go on for hours and hours, Mike. It's, just, it's a really interesting, fascinating conversation. It really is. Uh, is there anything else about your book that you'd like to add? Uh, well, just that people can purchase it if they go to bringingbackthelions.com. Uh, okay. They can also go to Amazon or anywhere like that. It's on Amazon. And it's yep. uh, the nice thing about it is uh, it's in the three versions. You know, you can get a paperback. You can get the Kindle and you can also get an audio book, which, yeah. uh, I, I hesitated to do the audio book. I'll just tell you because I'm old, I guess, or something, or I don't drive as much. As, and then my, uh, millennial son and daughter said, dad, you've got to do audio. Same. Everybody. And it's same. <laughs> I was the same way. My book was out a year before I finally recorded the audio book and it's doing well. It, it, it really yeah. is it's doing well. And so people, and you know, overseas, my friends overseas have said, thank you. You know, especially that my African friends, I said, this audio book is going to be perfect for our long trips. Yeah. And that because they drive a lot. So yeah. anyway, but yeah, bringing back the lions.com okay. and they can just type that into their web browser and it'll pull it up. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. But Mike's also a person of faith, you know, here at Christian Outdoors, we also like to have people share their, their story of faith as they feel comfortable doing. And, uh, Mike and I talked about that ahead of time. And Mike, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind sharing just a portion of your personal faith journey as well? Absolutely. Um, I grew up in, a uh, what I would refer to as a non-Christian home. Now, I don't mean that my my mom and dad didn't have some semblance of faith. They were part of the greatest generation, okay? And so they were that age. My mom just passed away this last year. She was 95, mm. and uh, she was a believer uh, when she passed away, and I'm really, you know, ecstatic about that. And sure, she, sure. Had a, she had a wonderful faith uh, that came to maturity fairly late in her life, Mm -hmm. uh, but I grew up in a home that we didn't, you know, we didn't attend church very often. It was, we were sort of like they say in Australia, C of E or, well, I lived in Australia for six years and they call them C and E years. And, uh, that's, uh, Christmas and Easter, right. uh, we would go, but we spent a lot of time outdoors. We raised horses. We did all sorts of stuff. I had a sweet childhood. I really did, but not too, not too much in terms of faith-based uh, kinds of interactions. Mm -hmm. And so what that led to, honestly, in my life, sadly, uh, was a lot of bad choices, uh, what I would call sinful choices. Uh, a lot of folks don't like the word sin anymore, but I think it's more appropriate in my life. Every Absolutely. Day I <laughs> Absolutely. I uh, recognize it a bit more. And so I got married and Francis and I have been married now for 45 years. Congratulations. Uh, but uh, two years into our marriage, we decided to get a divorce. And that was mainly because we were just selfish human beings and we were not facing looking at God or anything else. We were just looking for our own needs through that. Okay. My family, my parents stayed together. My 
parents-in-law stayed together for 60 years. You know, my brother and sister are both still married and they've been married longer than I am. I'm the baby. But through that experience, I realized how messed up I was, I think mm -hmm. is what I would say. And God really used that to draw me to himself and say, look, you can't fix this and you're never going to be able to fix it, but I can. Mm. And I uh, threw a friend um, who or an acquaintance, actually he wasn't a friend then. He became a friend, a pastor who we'd met, shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me and just said, look, you know, I can't fix you, but Jesus can. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it started. And that I was, uh, Francis corrected me. I wrote you that it was, uh, I was older than what I thought, but we had been married two years and we got married when I was 17. So I was 19. That's or, sorry, we got married when we were 19 and I was 21 when I came to Christ. We got, we got engaged when I was 17 okay. in high school. Um, I'm old. Okay. That's young, people used, man. People used to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so I was 21. And since that time, uh, it's been, I, I wrote you, it's been an up and down journey. Um, you know, I would love to say that I, uh, you know, I saw an upward trajectory straight line. Well, I have it. Uh, I don't think that that's I don't think really, any of us have. And I think if people say they have, they're not being completely honest with themselves. Or, well, or, uh, yeah, they just see it differently, I think. But yeah, perhaps, uh, yeah. I am, you know, I am uh, a member now of a, a wonderful evangelical church. Now, the denomination doesn't matter, but it's, you know, it's the Presbyterian Church in America. I, I happen to happen to belong to. I didn't know you did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a ruling elder in there, just which means okay. that I'm older and stupider than everybody else. And so they can point and laugh is what I tell, tell them. Part uh, of the frozen but, chosen, huh? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, it's really difficult to get us to clap. <laughs> it really is. I know. <laughs> same here. Same here. Or to laugh. No, I, I kid with you, but, yeah. But it's been a sweet journey. Um, 2017, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Mm. I was given a year to live. Uh, every time I go in and see my medical oncologist, I'm still cancer free after five That's years. Awesome. I awesome. uh, know. And uh, that shook my faith. I don't mean that it shook my faith to say, well, I guess God didn't love, doesn't love me. What I actually mean is it sort of shook it up mm -hmm. and it, it stirred up a lot of things that the Lord has now, I believe, wants me to look at a little bit closer, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Issues in my own life, positives in my own life. Mm -hmm. uh, it brought things into focus better. Um, but I wish I could say that you know, I felt like a confident warrior. I went into church one uh, throughout this time. I went into church one time and my my pastor looked at me and said, I'd like you to help me with communion this morning. Is that okay? And I looked at Morgan. That's who my pastor is. I looked at Morgan and I said, I just called the Lord the nastiest name I could come up with. And he, and Morgan looked at me and said, you think you need communion this morning? And I said, oh, I, <laughs> I, really, I, really I really need communion this morning. <laughs> Like really bad. <laughs> I need the whole loaf and the whole pitcher. I do. That's what I, you know, so that's the kind of thing that I've seen since coming to Christ is having this community of folks and, the, you know, and the Bible and prayer and everything right. else that's, right. that is just so refreshing that a lot of my friends don't have. Yeah. Uh, but I can tell them about it. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mike, thank you for sharing that. That's a great story. And it's, it parallels so many, and I've said this many times on Christian Outdoors podcast is there is no wrong way to come to Jesus, right? However you do, whether it's by osmosis, whether you grow up in the church or, or you come in and, and, you know, later in life it really doesn't matter. It's all yeah. important. And, and all of heaven rejoices every time somebody comes to the kingdom. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I want to give you another chance to tell people where to get their book, how they can get a hold of you if they want to. 
Um, Absolutely. I know it's, uh, uh, I'm going to let you do it so I don't mess it up. <laughs> oh, I forget too. But the uh, the book, Bringing Back the Lions, you can just go to bringingbackthelions.com. And it's also on Amazon and, and other outlets like that. But if you go to bringingbackthelions.com, it'll pull up the, the page on my website and you can get, you can read about it and you can get some information on it that way. Okay. Uh, if they want to get a hold of me uh, and want to email me, for example, it's mike at mikearnoldoutdoors.com. That's, that's pretty it. simple. That's pretty simple. Pretty I, I gotta like keep that. it simple for me. <laughs> that's what I say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same. I understand. It's like my email, Pete at ChristianOutdoors.org. It's just right there. That's all it is to it. So yep. Mike Arnold, thank you so much for joining me today. I really thank appreciate you. you taking the time. It's been a great conversation. Uh, I have learned a lot about trophy hunting and about the impact that it makes on on some of these developing countries and and, and I really appreciate you enlightening us on that. And also for all the work that you've done to help those people over there and also to uh, um, spread the word about the conservation of hunters. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to be on this. And thank you for allowing me to talk about my faith. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a sweet and a joyful thing to be able to do too. It is. It is. And, and that's one of the things that I try to do. I mean, it's, two of my passions. I love the outdoors. I love Jesus. How can we talk about the, both of them at the same time? So thank you for doing that. And I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you, sir.